Close inspection of an area of the outer surface of the brain and inner surface of the skull during the initial impact shows the soft, fragile brain scraping against the hard, jagged inner surfaces of the skull to create shearing forces. As the gray matter, comprised of cell bodies, and the white matter, comprised of axons, are of two different densities, the shearing forces create a plane of cleavage where many axonal injuries occur. The axons may be completely torn, partially torn, or separated from their connections with other cells. Thousands or even millions of scattered axons may be torn. But unless some of the larger and more resilient arteries are also torn, no bleeding occurs. Traditional imaging studies such as CT or MRI are not nearly sensitive enough to detect individual axonal injuries or even relatively large groups of axonal injuries. CT and MRI are designed to detect areas of bleeding. Unless a blood vessel or multiple vessels are torn, creating a relatively large bleed, these studies fail to demonstrate any findings that would indicate the presence of multiple, widespread, and microscopic axonal injuries that can result in devastating neuropsychological deficits. In situations when the forces involved are severe enough to result in injury to the blood vessels, the injuries to the axons are even more severe. An injury to one or more blood vessels results in the release of red blood cells into the surrounding brain tissue. CT and MRI are designed to detect blood, or after a period of time, the remnants of blood called hemosiderin. Large quantities of red blood cells must hemorrhage from a blood vessel or blood vessels to be detectable on CT or MRI. If even one small hemorrhage occurs that is detectable, it is an indicator that there are likely vast numbers of associated axonal injuries that are not depicted in the scans. In addition to the deceleration forces, rotational forces are typically involved in most collisions. The combination of rotational and deceleration forces results in traumatic forces on the brain that may be far greater than the force of the collision may imply. This combination of forces is very similar to combining cold temperatures with high winds. Either alone may be tolerable, but when temperatures of 30 degrees are combined with winds of 30 miles per hour, the net effect can be quite chilling. When the skull and brain are viewed in section from above, it can be seen that the brain consists of two halves that are connected by only a few central structures. One of these structures is called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum consists of axons that allow for communication between the opposite sides of the brain. The front of the corpus callosum is called the genu. The two halves of the brain are separated by a tough, ligamentous structure called the falx. The falx is rigidly fixed to the skull in the front, back, top, and bottom of the skull. During the violence of an impact involving the combined sudden deceleration and rotational forces, similar to the one shown in earlier animation sequences, the corpus callosum can often become injured. The injuries occur because the soft, friable brain reacts in a very fluid-like way as a result of the violent forces.
The left side of the brain impacts against the falx, and the right side of the brain pulls away from the falx. Because the falx is rigid, the axons that comprise the corpus callosum are torn and broken. Again, thousands of axons may be torn without being evident on imaging studies. Unfortunately, the majority of mild, traumatic brain injuries go undiagnosed. The difficulty in diagnosing these injuries is likely due to the combination of two factors. One, the absence of injuries on traditional imaging studies, and two, the casual clinician's perception of a normal appearing and behaving individual. Careful interviews of friends, family, and co-workers regarding the changes in an individual before and after a traumatic event may be the most reliable way to recognize those who have suffered these injuries. Those close to a brain-injured individual will often describe a completely different person before and after the incident. Only after the presence of a traumatic brain injury is diagnosed can one then proceed with measures to improve, or at least help cope with, the resulting problems.